powerful, powerful day this has been. Um, and we want to thank God for the vision, for the insight, and for the resources. <laughs> it takes resources. It takes some serious, serious planning for the dedication that God has blessed you, Babu uh, Lalambi and your family. I want to call it, this is not an MLV initiative. It's a family initiative, and we need to recognize and acknowledge that. It's not carried out by some corporate, you know, without personality, without sweat and blood. It was carried by family. So thank you for allowing God to move you in this way. And we've all benefited. Daniel and myself were sitting at lunch, and he mentioned something that I hadn't thought about. So I've been sitting here the whole day. I thought, hey, when am I preaching? At some point, I said, no, man, just wait and listen. And it feels like we were not called here to preach, but to listen and to be preached to and to be ministered to. And so I thank you for paying for this ticket that I may be ministered to. I really really thoroughly and properly needed this. For our message of departure, I'm going to take us to the book of Revelation chapter 6. I'm going to shock you, but it's in a good way, okay? I'm going to shock you. By the time you leave here, I want you to know that there was nothing wrong with Job's wife. There was nothing wrong with Job's wife. You need to learn from Job's wife. Right? You're going to take some lessons from Job's wife so that you're not as frustrated as you are. <laughs> but let me take you first to the book of Revelation chapter 6 before I take you to Job's wife. Maybe let me start with this. So the other day I'm sitting at home and my son comes up to me and he said something, you know, um, I can't mention it up here. He said something to me and I said, who are you talking about? He said, you. Just like that. He said, you, daddy. And I said to him, okay, what spirit has possessed you to talk to me like that, right? And he, I think he missed it, right? Um, and, but instead of backing down, he continues, right? So I ask his mother, hey, what's wrong with this boy? He seems upset at me, but I don't understand what it is about. Um, and of course, I'm also upset now. So I said to her, does he know who I am? Do you know? <laughs> does he know who I am? Does he know that I'm an ordained minister? Does he know that I've pre where does he know who I am? You know? And his mom laughs and, 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 and she says to me, To your son, you are just daddy who walks around the house in shorts and sometimes doesn't bath the whole day. <laughs> That's who you are to him, right? You're not this person that you think you are. So when he engages with you, it's within the parameters of how close he is to you. So he does not have any fear of you. Because what he knows you to be that allows him to be free around you. And she says, you need to celebrate that your son can be that open with you. Even if you do not like it when he says it. But just celebrate that he feels comfortable enough to say it to you, right? And of course, I want to ask now, is there anything that you've wanted to say to me which you did not say unto me? But what my wife and my child and my son are teaching me and were teaching me was that it is the mark of a healthy relationship to be honest, even sometimes brutally so, with the person you're in a relationship with. It is the mark of dysfunction to suppress your real and truest feelings if you're around, if you're with someone that you cannot say and you cannot utterly and completely be honest and be open with them. And so we go to the book of Revelation chapter 6, verses 9. And the Bible says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Listen to the response. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. The Lord always adds a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. What's happening here in heaven, right? You'll remember in chapter 5, is this, uh, is this figure that's sitting on the throne and he's got a scroll that he hands out and nobody's found worthy to take the scroll. And the elder, uh, John cries and he begins to weep. And the elder says to John, man, don't cry. Uh, Luke, the lion from the tribe of Judah has been found. He is worthy to open the scroll. And John says he turns looking for a lion and he doesn't see the lion. Maybe next time we'll talk about that. He doesn't see a lion, but he sees a lamb, right? And, he's, and, and he says, this lamb looked as though it had been slain, right? 
right? Whether it's so insignificant, it's so interesting that when the elder saw a lion, John saw a lamb. But did you know that the quality of the lion and is also found in the lamb? For the lamb of revelation is wild. The lamb of revelation fights. The lamb of revelation goes to war. The lamb of revelation is powerful. The lamb of revelation has the same attributes as a lion. Right, and so John says, I see the lamb and he has been found and he saw the lamb and the lamb goes to the throne and he takes the scroll. What is happening here then, right? And the Bible of course then says, when the lamb takes the scroll, then the 24 elders remove their crowns and they lay them at their feet and they begin to worship, right? But listen to this, I'm sure you missed it. The elders are not only laying their crowns on the floor, they're also carrying a bowl of incense. And John says, this bowl of incense, which is the prayer, of the saints oh you missed that one so they take off their crowns but they're carrying a bowl of incense which are the prayers of the saints then the lamb begins to break the scroll right of course there's a singing there's a coronation what you find in the scene right and i'm going to get through this technical bit so bear with me what you find in the scene is an old king abdicating the throne and handing the scroll to a new king. So the one who sits on the, on the throne, right, says it is time for someone else to take over the affairs of the earth. And who better than one who has been to the earth and has seen and experienced the afflictions of those who are on the earth. Now he is worthy to take the throne, right? So what is happening in heaven is a coronation, right? You just saw one. Oh, you haven't seen one. We saw one in KZN, the coronation of a new king. It is celebration. It is joyous. It is a party, right? There's a party happening in heaven. But in this party is the bowl of incense which has the prayers of the saints. No, you're not listening to this right now. All right. So then, so then, so then this, this lamb takes the, 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 the seal and he starts breaking the seal. The reason why he breaks the seal is that you cannot break the seal unless you have the capacity, the authority, and the resources to meet the demands of what is said after the seal is broken. Right. So the lamb is worthy to open the scroll. Why should the, should the scroll be talking about a war? The lamb is ready to go to war. Should the scroll be talking about a famine? The lamb is ready to provide food. Should the scroll, scroll be talking about a pestilence? The lamb is ready to provide healing. Why? Because by his stripes, we are healed. And so the lamb has been found worthy to take the scroll. Why? Because he has the capacity to handle whatever demands come from the scroll. Amen. Opens all these seals until it gets to the fifth seal. Right. And the Bible says in the fifth seal, then the souls from under the altar, wow. in the party. Wow. Oh. You're not listening to this. Yes, sir. You've never been invited to big occasions. <laughs> I can just tell. You've never been invited to big occasions. Uh. Right? So a couple of years ago here in South Africa, we had a president at the time, and he was accused of sexual violence against a, a lady. And there was an event that he attended, and he was going to give a keynote address. He went to this event, he stood up, and as he was about to, preach, uh, to speak, four young ladies who were topless came in carrying placards saying, Justice for Kwesi. Kwesi was this young lady that the president was alleged to have raped. Right? So they stood in front of him, Topless, and they said, justice for crazy. The TV commentators went nuts. How can they do that? It was not the time for that. Where was their sense of occasion? What were these four ladies doing is they were protesting. They were saying, you cannot be presidential when you've got this blotch against you. You cannot continue with life as normal when you've got this question hanging over your head. You're not listening to me. So the, the TV broadcaster said, it was their sense of occasion. But for me, that wasn't even the problem. The problem was the president's security. <laughs> the president's security came and took these ladies, handled them roughly, and threw them out of the venue. Why? Because their protest was humiliating the president. Powerful people do not like to be reminded of their own weaknesses and outstanding debts, right? They react and respond violently. Ah, I thank God that we do not serve a God who has a low self-esteem 
and a God who has a problem with protesters in the middle of a coronation. Right, we are laying a new king, but the souls are in attendance, saying, oh Lord, before we crown him, how long? Before we eat, how long? Before we sing, how long? In other words, we cannot continue with life as normal until you have responded to the injustice we have suffered. How long? We are you talking about a new normal. What about our loved ones who died on COVID? When will you respond to that? We're hearing you telling us that you'll take care of us as we move forward into this unknown and unpredictable future. What about the jobs we lost unjustly? How long? How long? Look, what these guys are saying, what these souls are saying, they're saying, don't blackmail us with heaven. Don't blackmail us with this glitz and glamour. Right, we have an issue with you. Pananyapa. Right, we've got an outstanding issue. Did I say that right? Pananyapa. Yeah, Pananyapa. We've got an issue here with you. Let us address this issue first. Before we join you in these celebrations, we want to address this issue. In other words, we cannot trust you with eternity if you have failed us with life. We cannot trust you with forever if you fail to handle us for 25 years. We need you to tell us, explain what went wrong. And so I go into a shop one day with my daughter, right? I go into a shop one day with my daughter. No, my daughter and I have this bond. We, we, we relate, we, jo- we bond over food. When she sees me, she rubs her tummy. and she says, I'm hungry. Every time I walk in, she sees me, we just bond over food. So every time we go to a shop, I buy her something, you know, it's nice. And she cries when I leave. It's just our bond. So I go to the shop one day. Hey, but daddy doesn't have money. Right? I just got money to do what I've been sent to do. I don't have money for anything else. He goes to the fridge we usually go to. When she goes to the fridge, we usually go to. She picks an item that we usually pick. She is behaving normally. She is acting in accordance to what she knows about her father. But what she hasn't done is confirm with the father if he's got the funds right, to do what we usually do. Then my daughter takes this thing. Hey, now I'm, I'm in trouble. So I said to her, no, baby. I mean, we live in an area with white people. You don't want to you don't have a chaotic child around white people there. You know, you want to be disciplined. Say, you don't want them to think these black children are chaotic. So this child is crying now. And I want to be shh, baby, I want to show these people that this child can speak English and she understands. You know, this, I was just trying to do too much. But the child throws this thing down because I said, you can't take it. We're not taking it. No, Mimi. And she throws it down and she throws herself on the floor. And she cries. Ah! Ah! She screams, right? And she screams. Do you know what she was saying? She was saying, Daddy, I don't understand. We've been down this road before. You did not behave like this. I'm not going anywhere until you explain to me why are you being different today when you have not always been like that. Ah! Do you know why my daughter can do that? It is because she knows this is my dad. She'll never do it to you, Jalambi, because you are not her father. She can only be that honest. She can only be that straight. She can only be that wild in her protest with her father. Do you know why the souls scream under the altar, even in the middle of a wedding? Do you know why? It is because they know this is our father. He's a king to you, but our father. How long, oh Lord? How long, daddy? We are not moving from here until you come back and explain to us why did you fail us. You delivered Paul and Silas from prison. You delivered Peter using an angel. Why did we die? How long? You brought him, to, you brought, you brought, you brought him from Nagamoyo from Mozambique. My son died right next door. How? I need to know. It's protest. The saints are saying, we refuse to proceed on pretentious faith with you. We are not moving from, where our, from the point of confusion as far as our faith is concerned. Until you come and explain why this is happening, we are not moving from here. Do you know why they can do that? Because the relationship is healthy. Now, remember I said to you, the protesters came. The security moved them. Because this is not the time to be doing this nonsense. 
Look at what God does. How long, oh Lord? How long? God says, okay, guys, just a little while. He takes out a white robe and he gives it to them. Right? Until all your brothers are complete, I'll deal with it. Response. Doesn't shut them up. Doesn't chuck them out. Do you know why? Because God doesn't have a problem with your protest when you don't understand his ways. God doesn't, God is not intimidated. Hey, have you ever noticed that a child walks in, you must know, parents, child walks in and asks the parent about mathematics, and the child said, hey, 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 leave me alone. When you, do you know why they are like that? Do you know why they react violently? It's not because they don't have time to teach their child. They have been collapsed by the mathematics. They don't know how to handle this thing. So they react violently. A violent response is born out of an inadequacy to address the question. But an adequate and a friendly and compassionate response is because there is a God who is not intimidated by the question. How long? You wait and see. But so long, hold on to this. Now let me close it off with this. Man. I want you to be honest with your God. It's okay. I, want you to, I don't want you to have an all-night prayer sending platitudes to God that you don't really believe in. Stop the faking and stop the faithing. Stop the faking. Stop the faithing. And faith requires honesty. I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't get it. I've done everything, but I'm still not getting. Do you know why I like the older brother in Luke 15? Honesty. I was here. I was here. You did not respond. You did not reward me as I expected because I know you to be a father who rewards obedience. Why are you rewarding disobedience? I, I understand the older brother. I understand his protest. I'm not going into that party until you explain to me why are you being irregular? I need to understand. I'm not moving from here until I said to Daniel, I don't preach from anything I have not experienced. And I've had these conversations with God. I said, I don't, I'm not going out to preach again until you explain to me why. Why? I'm not doing it until you tell me why. Why? And he's responded. He's responded. He's always responded. Do you know why? Because there's no question I can throw at him that he cannot answer. He's not like a, an unsmart father who doesn't know mathematics, who gets angry. Oh, mother's always, mommy, can I have chips? Hey, Nina, leave me alone. It's not that you don't want your children to have chips. It's, you don't have the money. Just be honest. Just say, hey, I don't have money. You know, don't, be, don't be like violent with them. So we, we respond violently when we are faced with questions that we cannot address. I'm going to give you time now, Daniel, right? said to you, I will not leave you here, understanding Job's wife. Right? You guys forget that Job was never pregnant. Right? It was this woman that carried those 10 kids for a total or some total of 90 months. She bonded with those kids long before Job met those kids. Yes, Job went and sacrificed for them. She nurtured them. Yes, Job prayed for them. She raised them. When they died, you think Job was broken? Just because the Bible doesn't tell you how broken she was? You think Job suffered when they died? Do you know who suffered more? It's this woman. But more than all of that, this woman not only has to experience the loss of her, of her ten children, children that she had a connection that was resident in her womb with, she also has to bear the pain of watching her husband constantly disappointed by a God he believes in. You're not listening. She has to look at Job faithfully following God and she has to see Job's, Job's life taking a downturn as a result of being disappointed by a God he was so faithful to. And you know what she's saying? She says, Job, the pain of being disappointed by God is so much why don't you ask him to kill you? <laughs> You're not listening. It's better to die than to live under, God, under the conditions revealing God disappointing you. Mm -mm. It's better, for, it's actually more merciful for God to kill you than to keep you alive in your suffering, especially if he's not going to end it. So Job, here's a solution. Curse God and die. You'll rather let this God kill you if he's not going to stop failing you. 
And you thought Job, and you thought you thought Job was saying to his, to her, "You speak like a foolish woman." And in all this, Job didn't sin. Did you read Job's speeches when he talks to his friends? Did you read his speeches? Yeah. Oh, that I was never born. Why did he make me? If you do, you understand? Job takes the lexicon of grief from his wife and continues with it for the rest of the book. Ah, guys, after chapter two, right? Job ceases to be Job and he starts speaking like his wife. His friends come to talk like Job. Ha! When Job is met with an opportunity to be honest about his pain, he answers theologically. He gives a Sabbath school answer. He gives a fundamental belief. Should we only receive good from God until he meets men who will not identify, who will not, be, who will not show him compassion, Instead of identifying with him, instead of feeling what he's feeling, they decide to give him theological answers. Then it becomes real. You didn't read that book. You didn't read it. You know why? You only rush into the devil. The devil did this. Who said this? Was it, was it Elder Moyo Elliot? Who said, no, before you read what these people are saying in the Bible, Read the experiences preceding what they say. Yeah. Pay attention to the experiences. But man, I digress. Here's the point. At the end of Job, Job's wealth is restored. Job's life is restored. Listen to God. God says to Job, go and offer a sacrifice for your friends. For they spoke unjustly about me. When Job is restored, the wife is there without a sacrifice or an apology because she said nothing wrong. Do you know who said something wrong? The friends. Stop trying to ignore your real pain by giving rehearsed theological answers. Sit with your pain. Be honest about your pain. Be real about your pain. And your father who hears, who knows what he owes you, yes. will not chuck you out, will not kick you out. And you know what the beautiful thing is? Right? Your prayers right now, your prayers right now are in the bowls of the elders. Ah, you're not listening. Your prayers are in the bowls of the elders. Do you know what that means? God doesn't have a period or a timetable where he says, now we are entertaining prayers. Now, at every given moment, those prayers fill the ambience of heaven. They change and transform. In other words, God refuses to enjoy the peace and tranquility of heaven without the constant reminders of what he owes you as it arrives in your prayers. Send them as they are. Send them as real as they are. Send them as raw as they are. And by the way, your prayers are not accepted because of how well you state them. They accept it because of how well God polishes them and presents them to himself. Send them. Heaven will edit them. Send them. Stop this faking nonsense. Stop trying to imitate and emulate people. Talk to your father. Be real. Tell him, I'm not moving from here. I'm not. I'm not moving past that that painful experience. Until you explain to me, where were you? What happened? What happened? I don't know you to be like that. What happened? What happened? What happened? Hold God accountable to the claims he makes. You said you'll be a God of life. Why is there so much death around me? You said you're a God of providence. Why do I lack so much? You said you're a God of peace. Why is my home in turmoil? You said you're a God of health. Why am I so sick? I I'm not moving from here until you respond. Send them.